back to Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. Uh, this video, I have uh, another uh, interesting discussion point for, for you. It's a very, very technical point, but uh, I think in the third installment, we can sort of, we have an idea of exactly how this is going to progress, and I want to, I want to engage you in more critical sort of assessments in philosophy, and the question is simply this. Could it be possible that there is an a priori justification for epiphenomenalist stance? Right? What in the hell does that mean, right? Could there be an a priori justification for an epiphenomenalist stance or epiphenomenalism? Well, for those of you who don't know, the question is, what is epiphenomenalism? And it's it's pretty it's pretty basic, at least at this level, right? And I'm going to leave this purposefully ambiguous to facilitate discussion. Epiphenomenalism is typically described in terms, or defined in terms, of two stances. There is an event, and the event has two characteristics. The first characteristic of the event is the physiological characteristic. The second characteristic is the mental characteristic. So any event in sort of event ontology can be described in two senses. The event as having physiological characteristic, the event as having mental characteristic. That's the first sort of aspect of epiphenomenal, um, what it is, the definition. The second characteristic is that within any epiphenomenal um, description, physical characteristics can be the source of a cause of a mental characteristic, but mental characteristics obviously cannot cause physical characteristics. We don't think of stuff and they appear in the real world. Also, however, and this is the important point, also, however, mental characteristics cannot be the cause of other mental characteristics. So that's basically epiphenomenalism grossly described in a few seconds. The question that I'm asking is, is it possible that there is an a priori justification for epiphenomenalism? which seems paradoxical. The question itself seems contradictory because to say that it is an a priori justification means that the justification is itself independent to experience. However, we're saying clearly that epiphenomenalism is within experience itself. It's rooted within experience, right? The condition for the description of an event is that the event has characteristics um, physiological characteristics, mental, physiological can be the causal factor in mental, but mental don't cause anything, right? Uh, clearly, that, that physiological receptivity of sense data is a product of a posteriori rather than a priori sort of circumstances. So how in the hell can we make sense of an a priori justification for epiphenomenalism? Um, and I'm not here to answer the question. I think it's a pretty interesting question. Why? I'll sort of set the framework. Obviously, I do have an idea of where I think you could answer this question, but I'm not going to put it out there because it's not about my answer. It's about creating a discussion. Um, if you think in terms of the um, Copernican revolution in Kantian terms, I think it's a similar question that Kant asked himself during his time. And what Kant wanted to do is to say that with respect to phenomenal, not epiphenomenal, with respect to phenomenal experience, is there a way in which I can make sense of phenomenal experience using a priori methods of justification? And I've done videos on sort of Hume's fork and um, Immanuel Kant's synthetic a priori. It's a 21st century challenge to, just for the hell of it, just for the fun of it, to see if you could make sense of um, epiphenomenalism in terms of an a priori justification. So that's the nature of this rather super complex and technical question that I'm just throwing out there. Again, it's just a point for discussion. It's, uh, it's really nothing more than that. So I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Have a good day.